Hi, welcome back to the last of the really great Wang Doodles. Today I'm going to be reading chapter 8 of part 2. When Lindy woke up, she found the splinter cat sitting beside her, washing himself. Goodness, she said, did I sleep for very long? Not too long, replied the cat, licking his paw. How do you feel, Miss Lindy? I feel fine, but I think I ought to be getting home. My brothers might find out that I'm gone and be worried. The cat sprang up. Ah, Miss Lindy, I have a tremendous favor to ask you. I wonder if you could help me with this. He produced a large ball of wool. Every friend that comes to visit makes a cat's cradle with me. I add it to my house. It's like signing my guest book. Lindy frowned. All right, but please, let's hurry. She is beginning to feel a little annoyed. What do I have to do? The splinter cat worked the wool quickly between his paws until it made a pattern of cross threads. Now, Miss Lindy, use the finger and thumb of each hand and pick up the wool in the middle. Lindy did as she was told and the cat transferred the threads to her hands. Perfect, breathed the splinter cat. He lifted a paw to take up the wool again. Somehow the thread slipped and Lindy found her hands bound by the tightly colored threads. My dear, the cat blinked in alarm. It slipped out of my grasp. Hold on, dear friend. Let me unwind you. He turned Lindy around. I think the wool goes under here and through here. Lindy began to feel dizzy. For the, for the cat passed the ball of wool under her arms and around her waist and over her hands so quickly that she didn't have time to follow his movements. The results were disastrous, for by the time the cat had finished, she was so tangled up in the wool that she couldn't move. What have you done? She said in an angry voice. I told you I wanted to go home. It's terribly late, and you promised we would be back in an hour. Well, well, well. How goes it? Said a familiar voice, and Lindy felt a, sh a chill run up her spine. The proc's tall frame filled the doorway. The splinter cat cast a quick look towards Lindy. Good heaven, good heaven, splinter cat. What have you been up to? The proc began to laugh. The cat chuckled too. Lindy had seen and heard enough to know that she was now in terrible trouble. She glared at the proc. I know what you're doing, she said, trying desperately not to cry. You can stop all this and let me go home. The professor is going to be furious with you when he finds out. He already knows, my dear, the proc replied casually, and I've told him that if he wants you back, then he must tr stop trying to reach, reach the wing doodle. If he agrees, you may go home at once. What if he doesn't agree? Well, that's a problem we'll have to face when the time comes. He turned to the splinter cat. Keep her here. I'll be in touch. I've got to push on to the palace. Is the wangdoodle very upset? The splinter cat asked. He's beside himself, replied the proc. He believes this is all my fault, and he's keeping me twice as busy because he's cross. The cat shook his head sympathetically. Don't worry, proc. It'll all be over soon. Yes, thank goodness. The proc raised a hand in farewell. Goodbye, Miss Lindy. I apologize for the inconvenience, but I had no alternative. Lindy took her shook, <laughs> Lindy turned her head away and didn't answer, and when she looked back again, the proc had gone. The splinter cat stretched and yawned. Oh my, it's going to be a long day. How about some watch, Miss Lindy? Don't you talk to me, she snapped. You're a false friend. If I had my way, you'd lose all the rest of your, not, your eight lives right now. The splinter cat winced, but he said simply, Just as you please. He stretched back on the pillow and idly stroked the pieces of wool above his head. Rippling notes of music came from the taunt strings. And Lindy watched with surprise as the splinter cat played on the wall of his house as though it were a harp. Her thoughts turned to the professor and Thomas and Benjamin. She knew how worried they must be. What would the professor do in a situation like this? Would he give in to the proc, or would he try to rescue her? Lindy thought that the boys would encourage such a move, 
But if they did try to find her, how would they know where she was? Suddenly, she had an idea. It wasn't a very good one, but it was the best she could come up with. She began to sing a song to the splinter cat's music. The creature looked startled, but he smiled happily, until Lindy's great relief continued to play. Ben, Tom, and the professor had been searching for hours, and there was still no sign of Lindy. Suddenly, Tom noticed something on the horizon. He studied it for a moment and then shouted, Professor, look, it's the wiffle bird. They watched as the wiffle birds flew straight to them and settled on Tom's shoulder. He patted the beautiful feathers and said, I knew you'd turn up sooner or later. We're in a terrible fix, with wiffle bird. We can't find Lindy and we simply must reach her somehow. The bird made sympathetic noises and preened herself. And at that moment, an eerie noise came out from over the plateau. It was a dreadful noise, mournful and lonely, a wailing, sobbing cry that moved up and down the scale and went echoing through the mountains. What on earth was that? Ben spoke in a hushed voice. The professor held up a hand. Listen, there it goes again. Tom frowned and then said tentatively, I may be imagining things, but I think I hear something else, another sound underneath it. Do you know what I mean, professor? The professor looked at the boy sharply. Are you sure, Tom? Tom listened carefully. Yes, yes. Do you know what it is, he cried? It's Lindy. I can hear Lindy singing. Where, Tom? Where is it coming from? The boy strained to pick up the tiny, fragile sound from across the shifting echoes. And then, for one moment, the wailing stopped, and in the silence, Lindy's voice came through clearly. That way, Tom yelled, pointing. That's where she is. No one was prepared for what happened next. The wiffle bird suddenly shot up in the air. Mayday! She shrieked, and then again, Mayday! The professor looked out and saw a huge shadow coming towards them. Look out, he cried. Grabbing both boys, he shoved them to safety under the nearest tree. Seconds later, a whirling wind like a hurricane flattened them all to the ground. What is that? What is it? gasped Ben in panic. A gastious oh, coughed the professor as the dust swirled around them. The huge shadow passed overhead again, and the boys caught a glimpse of a colossal wing with large ragged feathers. Black talons scraped the earth as the monster above them banked to avoid the tree, and the swirling air engulfed them again. Where's the wiffle bird? Tom looked for her anxiously. She squawked indignantly from the branches above his head. The professor and the boys waited a full five minutes before coming out from under the tree. To their relief, the giant bird was nowhere in sight. The professor wiped his brow with a spotted handkerchief. Good Lord, that was close. We were lucky, very lucky indeed. Ben was badly shaken. Do you think the gaseous saw us? I doubt it. It surely would have attacked us, for it's a dumb creature that acts first and thinks later. You know, if it had wanted to, it could easily have picked up that whole tree. Tom said fervently, Well, I hope we don't run into it again. The professor scrutinized the sky and the mountains. I think we're safe now. Let's hurry and get Lindy and get ourselves out of this mess. He set off in a westerly direction, the boys falling into step behind him. The wiffle bird shook herself and then flew ahead as if leading the way. The splinter cat had been howling ever since Lindy completed her first song. In the beginning, he had been playing the accompaniment for her, overjoyed with the sweet music they were making together. But as the song progressed and Lindy's clear voice sang the melody to perfection, the cat's amber eyes had filled with tears. He continued to play, but every once in a while drew a paw across his face and sighed deeply. When the song was over, he said with feeling, Oh, Miss Lindy, you sing so sweetly. Thank you. It's because you play so well, replied Lindy. Seeing the cat was flattered, she added, Let's do some more. This is fun. The cat took up the accompaniment once again, and Lindy put all the expression she could into her voice. The splinter cat began to blink furiously and suddenly he could control his feelings no longer he rolled back his head and howled lindy quickly realized that the howling was much louder than her voice and would carry twice as far 
If the professor and the boys were anywhere in the vicinity, they would certainly hear her. So she continued to sing. Oh, Miss Lindy, the cat bawled. Stop, I can't stand it. It's so pretty. His back leg drummed the floor and his fluffy tail waved rhythmically back and forth. Please play something else, coaxed Lindy. I'm having such a good time. The splinter cat hiccuped and wiped his nose. <gasps> he began to strum another melody, but when Lindy joined in, the strain became too great, and again he broke down completely. Stop, 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 he sobbed. He rolled on the floor, covering his head with his paws. Lindy took a deep breath and wondered how much longer she could keep this up. She almost choked with surprise as the professor's head popped into view over the threshold. He cautiously peered into the room and put a finger to his lips and then ducked out of sight. The professor ran back to the bushes where the boys were hiding. She's in there all right, he puffed. Now the question is, how are we going to get her out? He had no sooner uttered the words than the wiffle bird, who had been sitting quietly in a nearby tree, flew to the ground, landing a foot or so from the splinter cat's pad. She squawked horribly and lay very still. What's the matter with her? Tom said anxiously. Shh, the professor said sharply. The howling of the splinter cat had stopped. In the silence, the wiffle bird squawked again, as if in great pain. The splinter cat's head, startled head, popped through the strands of wool. His amber eyes were red with emotion and tears. The cat looked around quickly and saw the apparently helpless wiffle bird laying on the ground. His ears picked up, his tail perked up, and, oh, his ears picked up, his eyes opened wide, and then became calculating gleaming slits like this. He disappeared again. Professor, whispered Tom, we've got to do something. The wiffle bird is in trouble. Wait, Tom, wait. The professor laid a restraining hand on Tom's arm. The splinter cat came out of his house, his belly pressed flat to the tree. The wiffle bird fluttered in panic and rolled a few feet away. She began to emit a series of agonized squeaks and gasps. Ugh! The splinter cat eased his way down the tree. His ears were flattened, a wicked grin on his face. Then he pulled himself forward one paw at a time until he was just a few feet away from the wiffle bird. Ben held his breath. Tom, horror-stricken, nudged at the professor's sleeve. But the professor again signaled for the boy to wait. The splinter cat's body tensed and his high behind began to move from side to side. With a mighty leap, he sprang for the wiffle bird. She rocketed into the air, evading the grasping claws by mere inches. Beautiful feathers flew in all directions. She landed a little ways away from the cat and dragged herself along the ground. The cat looked surprised. He pounced again. Once more, the wiffle bird shot up in the air. She flapped around in low circles and the cat's head twisted wildly. His neck was now a corkscrew. The professor took a small pen knife out of his pocket. I'm going to get Lindy. Wait for me here and don't move. The splinter cat had been lured a considerable distance from the tree. The professor waited until the cat had his back to him and then quickly and silently he ran to the ladder and climbed up. Lindy was overwhelmed with relief when she saw him. The professor quickly cut her loose. Stay close to me, and when I tell you, run as fast as you can. As the professor and Lindy climbed down the ladder, they glimpsed the splinter cat thrashing wildly in the air and the wiffle bird spinning and rolling and tumbling in all directions. When the cat struggled to recover both balance and senses, oh, while the cat struggled to recover balance and his senses, Lindy and the professor ran to the bushes where the boys were hiding. The children hugged each other silently. Now what do we do? whispered Ben. We wait to see if the wiffle bird is going to be all right, and then we get out of here. By some miracle, the wiffle bird had evaded all attempts at capture. The cat, obsessed with the desire to catch this annoying and elusive bird, made a last flying leap, jaws snapping, teeth tearing, yowling, snarling, and slashing the air with his claws. The wiffle bird shot up in the air and shrieked, Get to the point! The splinter cat crashed to the ground. Get to the point, the point, ah, uh, the point. The professor looked around in desperation. That's what she means, that point up there. 
He looked up at a needle-sharp rock at the top of the hill. Run, children, run for your lives. He grabbed Lindy's hand and began the steep ascent, scrambling over rocks and stones. The boys followed. The wiffle bird flew above them and shrieked again, Get to the point! Dazed and completely frustrated, the splinter cat picked himself up and looked around. As his vision cleared, he saw the children and the professor. With a demented howl, he streaked towards them, legs churning, his powerful high behind propelling him up the hill with great leaps and bounds. He's gaining on us, gasped Tom. Don't look back, the professor yelled. He put on a burst of speed, and Lindy, who still clung to his hand, felt herself momentarily lifted off the ground. They were almost at the top of the hill, but the splinter cat was horribly close. Ben felt the ground shaking, and he heard the cat panting behind him with murderous fury. With a last mighty effort, the creature sprang. Got you! Got you! Got you! He roared triumphantly, his huge paws spread wide, the wicked-looking claws flashing like steel knives in the sun. The professor grabbed the narrow rock and swung around it, pressing himself and Lindy flat against the rough stone. The boys flung themselves to the ground, and the cat sailed over their heads, a crazed look on his face. He shrieked, his back legs trying desperately to break his tremendous speed, but it was too late. On the other side of the rock, the hill fell away sharply, and the splinter cat sailed over the edge and landed on the steep incline. His long back legs pushed him forwards and upwards and over, and he rolled and bumped and crashed from side to side, desperately trying to gain a foothold. Great burrows of earth appeared as he dug his heels. Billowing clouds of dust rose behind him as he plunged, howling at the top of his lungs all the way down. At the bottom of the hill, he tumbled into a field of bright mustard yellow flowers and completely disappeared. The professor began to chuckle. Relief and exhaustion flooded over him. It's a well-known fact, he explained, that splinter cats with their high behinds are very good at climbing up hills, but they're very bad at going down. Good old Wifflebird, she knew what she was doing when she told us to get to the point. I can't but help feel sorry for the splinter cat, said Lindy. Don't, my dear. If I'm not mistaken, our furry friend just landed in a field of catnip. He will be happy for quite some time. Suddenly, with a squeal of happiness, the splinter cat exploded out of the flowers at the bottom of the hill. He did a dum double somersault and landed in the blossoms again. His head popped up with one of the blossoms in between his teeth. <laughs> there was a dazed, happy grin on his face, and he began to leap about as if he was dizzy and delirious. Hoo-wee! <laughs> the children and professor watched as he yelped and bounced. Stop it! I like it! He rolled on his back, kicking his legs in the air. Oh, ha! Sweet! S sweetness! He howled with laughter as if he were being tickled. The children all began to giggle. Help! I love it! I love it! I love it! They heard the cat mumble passionately. And he went tearing off around the field, tumbling and turtling and sniffling and sneezing and twittering and flooding in an absolute dither of delight. That, Lindy, is, said the professor, is a perfect example of the word ecstatic. <laughs> And the next part is part three, and it's called Conquest. So we'll read that next. Thanks.